Good evening, poetry fans. <laughs> I'm Rex Aerosmith, one of the founders here at Cambridge Common Writers. Cambridge Common Writers is a Lesley University MFA and creative writing alumni organization. Uh, we are made up of alums from the six MFA genres in the Lesley University MFA program. Tonight, I'm pleased to present one of our poetry alums and my friend, Clarissa Adkins graduated in the winter of 2019 and will, read, and will read from her debut collection, Building Alexandria, which was published this year by the Lilly Poetry Review. Clarissa Adkins was a finalist for the 17th annual Erskine J Poetry Prize. She's published in Passengers Journal, The Pinch, Work Magazine, Parenthesis Journal, Smartish Place, Pace, The River City Poets Magazine, Parenthesis Journal, uh, the River City Poets Anthology, Lingering in the Margins, and many others. She also reads for Sugar House Review. When not writing poems, Clarissa is a high school English teacher where she also co-coordinates her school's Poetry Out Loud program. Clarissa wanted me to mention that she's an amateur mushroom photographer when a year is particularly damp. After Clarissa's reading, we are inviting additional readers to read for three to five minutes. If you have something to read, please put your name in the chat and we will get to as many as possible. So now here is Clarissa. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? I just, uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight and thank you all for coming. I see that my dad is here. So thank you dad for uh, coming in and I won't make you show yourself, but just know my dad is beautiful. So. <laughs> And I uh, just want to thank Lily Poetry Review Books, Cambridge Common Writers, uh, Eileen Cleary, Christine Jones, Martha McCullough uh, for believing in this project and making it become a reality. And I'm just going to go ahead and start with a poem that's not in the book. And it's been uh, requested by my dear friend Rex. So, and you may have heard this one before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway. How to tell a girl about a UFO. Don't hold back. Make the saucer a mothership and rest assured, although she believes in aliens more than she does not, and she was the one who brought up outer space in the first place, the woman you are wooing will never actually believe you. Use words like prismatic, glorious, and galactic testicle when describing the lights emitted from that interstellar gondola. Make your story an open book of your ulterior intentions. In this story, the spaceship is the size of a football field. In this story, we, or vaguely referenced girlfriends, are at this so out of the way vacation house. In one story, the conditions worsen quickly. We think the greys were stealing all the oxygen within a three mile radius. We went underground to a secret secluded fallout shelter. You will know secretly more than anything, she wants to witness an event of the first kind of her very own. And she knows for sure that you like her very much. And she was nearly curious about your private abduction scar, one that oddly correlates with a mishap untold. The diving board trick at French camp attempted for a brunette whose laughs were barely contained until you could say, yeah, I'm okay. Lastly, your current pursuit also knows the most likely direction of all your chronicles will always include the most extreme of any possible depictions. For you and for her, this final chapter will be an experience of the last kind. So that was for you, Rex, thank you. <laughs> all right, so I decided I was going to read poems from the book, I'll just ignore my notes there, uh, that I had not read at the original launch. So just to kind of spice things up a little here. And I'm gonna start with Before She Got Away. The, the extraction will not come from a weaponized knife, but from a lifelong surgery, where the tongue first gives up playing a part in the philosophy of being a tongue. Then a doctor holds it between two fingers like sharks pacified by being twisted onto their backs, which marine biologists remind us is not dreadful for sharks or so they believe. But in this case, woman being not of the ocean or even a species perfected for millions of years that holds just this flaw of being stunned into docility so easily is actually most painful to the taste when so paralyzed. 
And this process of losing is when the first protective coating of the tongue melts just a little and kiss off of the dorsum's plea to find a new mouth. The seasoning of this coating remains unknown. All flavors from here on out are too bland or hot or without sense of medium. Some degree of all woman's removal should be each woman's, which may whistle a bit within the watered hum of their exposed cords. And there is a trap sewn for her into a man's back pocket where the tongue lasts longer than the woman, a temporary comfort. Okay, um, this one is, I haven't read this one before, except when I was editing it, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's called Passing by the Lich Gate. And it's based a little bit about driving through the country and seeing a woman just randomly out there by herself putting little plastic flowers down at a grave. In the Baptist graveyard, a woman with a bright, long, blonde wig tends to plastic flowers. The acre has no fence, just two freestanding brick columns connected by the Lich Gate's iron, the stock gate of earthy, heavy protection of black and brick, of blue and sky, god illusions of the godless, adorned by eternal lilies, silken, heavily, heavenly perfection, her ache and hover over the dead, roaming just past the lich gate, dangling her locks above bevel markers in her electric blue blouse, the honey perfume and sweat drip without reason to bathe for the dead. And I don't know if you can tell, but um, I have a dog at my feet licking my toes while I was reading that poem. So I'm gonna try to um, get him to move back a little. Thank you, Truman. He, he wants to be a part of everything. All right, um, so this is, Mustard Original, and this was in parentheses journal. Truman, hold on. Okay. Mustard Original. Pungents of acidic honey appear like lava, glowing shadows along wood panel. I sit in an amalgam of bucket wenge armchairs and think no toes ever fully scour the ochre of shag carpet or the paprika of 1973 family rooms. The teak in its circles in modern lines, artifacts and viscers, mid-century glossed into retro, disguised as body knowledge, human cubism. I can almost dip my hands in the canary and coat the tandem chairs warp Sears catalogs into dandelion wallpaper, into tri-levels and split levels, burnt yellow kitchen countertops as stringent painted upon us, the children. Stuck to these fiberglass chairs, our knit tweed pants sharing wool with this latter day Dijon. We were often left alone, smeared with harvest gold, stirred by cadmium's evolution, sprouting in our jars, which once contained hexavalent chromium, an orange-tinged whiskey named National School Bus, spooned thick onto buses, debuted 1939, the first sulfur spark of pencil yellow number twos, septic decades irritating each vinegar seam. Okay, um, so that was an exploration of the color mustard. So that was the influence there. Um, this one is dedicated to my other dog, Maybelle, just so you know. It's called Good Girl. I have shown you all my brain contains. First, the English plucked from Persia a mastery of the walnut and made it their own. In this way, it's like the English calculated in rudimentary imitation math, how to claim both sides of the brain. And through this, the walnut's symmetry. Maybe grasping the mini unwashed fuzz behind the hound's head is better than the walnut's histories and grooves. Short-haired, she avoids these patterns. Maybe her bony crown creates a pinnacle which allows her thinkings to retract into the backdrop of her canine mind. And this alone balances right and left lobes. It's good, 
how she will not worry for English or for ancient Persia the way I do. There's always a moment of tranquility about this particular animal head, the fur that covers her skull. This is the last thing I needed to tell you. Okay. Um, so dad's still here. This is about a lake that I grew up near. And of course I lost my page and get back there. Uh, there was a strange little collection of concrete right on the water's edge and it was sort of this mound of concrete and we would play there, we'd have fights there, we'd fish from there. And it became this sort of memory. Fishing kids rock seat to throw the dead fish heads to, to fight like bog children, trident for the throne, the molded ash and soil, an insect's grand estate as a little fisherman's seat. It could still be there in the path to the lake did taller trees like the patch to the right of the marsh find root near the pyramid seat? The concrete mountain, awkward. It was uneasy to make the hop just over the tide of water. The rock pile builders built it, a concocted tower like a wasp mound, regal for marching fish catch kids. The boldest child would have weaved through brush if it were now, then to avoid the flooded muds by the wood, swampiest by the water where kids also caught snapping turtles. Could have been with a shoe and a hook, but no bacon, no worms, no star crunched little debbies for kid fishers. The patch of lake ignored. No kids would go in, but now think, it's all those woods now all over grown. So the path is a different shape and the swamp has roots. All right, and I have uh, one more for now, and then I'm gonna, I might have another one I can read later, but I want to make sure we have lots of fun with other writers in here tonight. I've never read this one before either. Uh, this is Pretending to be a Stingray. Enjoying your morning glory mind as ocean, as modal as the diving gull, you mosey. The treeless green blue feel rain seeds touch the ceiling of sea, then watch them ricochet to shadow. Your mother loves to know that your tiny feet fit into the world of gliding as able as any of those beveled birds and roaming fish. When your legs are grown, you run free and upright in the street, but your mother can't confirm the words which best describe how you came to play this way. Thanks, everybody. I hope um, you enjoyed that. And I really appreciate you being here. Hi, Kakila. <laughs> Hi, you look amazing. That was wonderful. Thank you. You look amazing, too. Thank you. Good to see you. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to, I believe, Rex. Are you running the open mic? Absolutely. Um, so we have some uh, takers. So let's start with Dan. All right, um, I have two short ones. The most recent two that I've been working on, actually one was published, part of one was published in Passengers Magazine. In that sense, uh, I've worked that into a little bit longer piece. So uh, it's called Snakeskin Elegy. Bearing myself, Against the earth, my body blisters, my caseous shingles. Shifting, collecting like a tide might bundle an ocean's briny bones. Blossoms appear on a barren limb. My snakeless skin evolves like fire poppies, helping themselves to the black earth. Caught on a wisp of twig, a sloth of snakeskin twitches Morse code messages on ticker tape parchment with serpent letters, lashing a husk of milkweed. Picket sign scales flutter moth rhythms above the goldenrod. Bailed in a wrinkled coil like wire crimped from a roll, I lie discarded, refuse, littering the road, listening to rainwater, rainwater hiss through a sewer gurry. I unravel unspooled smoke chasing the water. 
And I'd like to thank Truman for the sound effects in the background. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the last one is uh, uh, called Ongoing Acts of Kindness. Kneeling in the garden, my grandfather's hands gouged the dark earth. In his broad calloused palm, a collection of seeds undergo a thick thumbed inspection. Fingers craft of, craftily organize each kernel into its burial bed as precisely as he might tie the tail to a fly or teach me to secure a worm on a hook. Thanks, guys. That's my contribution to the night. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Michael. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, I am I'm going to be a pain in the butt, and I'm going to uh, push you to close out the night with another poem uh, after we've all read for the open mic, because I want to hear more of your work. I would and love Dan, to. Thank you. Good. Uh, Dan, that was great. It, I, I said in the chat, I haven't heard you read in ages, and I really dug your imagery. That was really, really nice. Thanks. So. Thanks, Michael. It's, uh, as you know, it, I had a little uh, time away from writing for a while after you graduate. You got to try to get back into it, but thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, you, you found your way. Keep doing that. So I am going to read a poem that is due out in Thrush in their September issue. Uh, it is an elegy for a poet friend of mine who died uh, about a month ago at this point, although it, it both seems like longer and shorter. So, before I lived in this house, someone else did and planted haphazard daffodils in liminal spaces along the fence line in the thin verge between basement window and driveway. A surprise every spring. I do nothing, but they return and return to hang their pallid heads. Who can say what they mourn? Surely we have no shortage of sorrows and complicities. In the year you died, the cold spells dawdled through April. We never knew if what fell was pollen or snow until sun punctuated it. Attentive presence is a gift that gives itself in two directions. The ruptured and aloof don't understand possibility. They see only what wrongness is. You saw that too, and yet knew it wasn't all. Incarnated in joy, insulted by its opposition, rich with compost, with children. Dirt is a poem, you might say. Taste how sweet. That's for my friend, Michael Bigner. And I'm going to read an extraterrestrial poem in honor of Clarissa and that wonderful <laughs> UFO poem. Each jaw is just a lever used to crush. In flesh, we believe but don't trust. And every named place is an outpost of now along the supply chain future grinding scrub pine stumps into particle board, hot gluing beads to mirror frames, scuttling desert word as dawn thistles itself astride the horizon. You remember long ago that space brothers came to Palomar Mountain, to White Sands, to Turbental, with dire warnings about atomic war, benevolent ones, blonde as a Hitchcock mistress, to save us from the shame of self-irradiation. Where did they go? Who do they counsel now? Hell, what if our Anthropocene isn't an existential threat to their well-being and they won't be back, so only our exquisite plaque-stained teeth will serve to note our existence? Thank you. Michael, that was amazing. I like Love the blonde that. as a Hitchcock mistress. That is, um, I wish I had <laughs> I know. <heard> that. <laughs> Love that, Michael. The, the original line uh, was blonde as B.B. Anderson, but then I realized that nobody remembers who B.B. Anderson is. So here we go, blonde as a Hitchcock mistress. <laughs> not, not nobody. <laughs> Some uh, of us. Yeah, uh, Christine. 
you have something to read? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I'll read two. I'll read one that I'm currently working on from in progress with my new manuscript. <clears throat> that's about um, my expen my experience with my mom and her dementia. And then I'm going to read one from my book that Clarissa said that she really liked. So on uh, honor of Clarissa, I'll read that one. But first, I'll read Wondering Who I'll Be in my mother's newest script for Let Me Introduce You to My 120-Year-Old Father. I can be maybe Matel Florette from Quebec, wearing pale blue shoes, quilting ladies with peach hats. I'll have white peppermints in a bowl, though I won't know how to pretend her polio. Better if I'm a Tel Carmel, the Franciscan who traveled the world. I'll read to orphaned children in Rome, canoe with the Inuits of Manitoba. Or I could be Matel Rain, the nun who lived in the convent by a pond where the ducks get leftover ends of unholy host. I'll spend days sewing hems of sisters' habits. It won't be that bad. I'll smile and nod, say, pardon? Mom will expect I can't hear, will repeat her stories about Mr. and Mrs. Honeybloom and the hand-me-down she had to wear, 13th child. With luck, I'll stay, Christine. She'll know my voice, she'll know the birthmark on my right cheek. And here's one from my book that came out last year, Girl Without a Shirt. And this one's for Corsa, titled Da Vinci's Treatise on Painting. An enameled bowl on a table covered by gold cloth with frayed tassels folded into the corner of the frame. And in the bowl, three content apples, two pears and a plum. Hear the skin, split, taste the juice of an oblong plum mashed to the ground, bubbled with sugar, shrouded with fat ants. The plum shifts, grows to a hibiscus, an osprey, a crab that burrows, wanting you to find its mad flower, its winged mate, its pith and purple ash. That's it. Thank you, Christine. I absolutely love that poem. I'm so glad you read that. And I love the first one as well. Thank you. Thanks. Fun to read. I always felt it's really gutsy to put anything about plums in a poem because oh. of the plum poem, you know, but um, you totally turned it. You did it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, this is fun. And yeah, Michael, I haven't heard you read forever. So that was great. And Dan, I've never heard you read. I wasn't there at Leslie when you were there. Um, I had already gone. So uh, this is always such a nice way to, to um, I'm happy when I can attend. So and I'm happy to hear Clarissa read some more poems. Actually, I'm going to read one. Are you going to read Rex? Excellent. Yeah. I haven't heard just, you read yet. I, I want to read one poem and this is for Clarissa as well. Um, Clarissa and I have a side project. So this is sort of a this is the uh, sort of the, one of the things that started us on this one, on this project, which I will explain later if anybody cares. Uh, this one is called Keys, the Musical for Clarissa. She heard the coming key master by the keys jangling from his waist chain, whistling a song haunting and familiar. She could almost hum along, almost. She'd made up lyrics and started to sing, louder and louder as he approached, closer and closer, until two by two, he jingling, whistling, she in unison, singing, suddenly he'd wrap the refrain. There you are, my avatar, my North Star. I got them keys, keys, keys. You've been looking for these, my chickadee. I got them keys, keys, keys. They've been locked, you grokked deadlocked, nay, padlocked. I got them keys, keys, keys. When last we met, I earned my sobriquet. Communication is the key to life. You mistook my flageolet, my courgette. Communication is the key to love, a duet snuggled on a moquette. Communication is the key to us. She was a locksmith by trade, a safe cracker, 
a, 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 a safe cracker. Her songs were magical, ma 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 magical, like a dirigible? No, alchemical. Singing her song into a locked safe, it would exhale, opening reluctant like the clenched jaw of a pug on a bone? No, a pharaoh's ancient tomb. Hearing her song didn't make him happy, but it did make him way less sad, lonely. He carried keys categorical. He liked keys soulfully lyrical. His keys were all metaphorical. Her songs unlocked his vaulted ventricle. Her songs unmasked his soul, an oracle. She sang to him questions, rhetorical. Thank you. So now we'd love to hear from Clarissa again. Oh, well, I just wanted to um, put this out there that I know we have uh, amazing fiction, nonfiction writers in here as well. So I don't know if there's an opportunity for that or, you know, I don't want to say there this. Absolutely, yes, anybody can read. Yeah, I would love to hear from other people as well. But um, I, I can read this poem here that is, it's another one not in the book, but it's one of my personal ones that I kind of like. And um, Kevin Proofer encouraged me to write this one, I guess. Explanation of Skull Philosophy. Put a banana up to your ear and say hello into the banana. Save this for the morning in front of your family. Use it for those whom you never hear laugh enough. Notice it's easy to get a song into someone's head, scratch the notes into the bone right between scalp and skull. Music plays in the perimeter. The tune grows centripetal, forms an ooze. Maybe this is why there are headphones called skull candy. When you meet a man and notice the size of his head, it could mean you're a curious person or you're in love with him. Talking like this could be appropriate for Halloween and this kind of speak. Then suicide starts in the stomach as anxiety but solidifies once it gets into the head, right between the ears, like concrete speakers. Some think this way around their birthdays. And then there's a woman who lives inside the engineering box, tucked into bushes, underneath each intersection stoplights, who has a narrow head and body so she can fit inside the box and change the lights from green to yellow to red. When someone told you no one lives inside intersection fuse boxes, this woman disappeared forever. Actually, I used to think that that there was a person who lived inside those boxes at the stoplight. So it's a it's a true story. Actually, I have a story about that. If I can just throw this little like anecdote in there. Yeah. I, those who know me know I used to work for DCF with the Department of Children and Families here in um, Massachusetts. And we always have like crazy stories that we're sharing back and forth. And so one of my colleagues um had a call that she had investigated because a child was found kind of walking alone and he had walked all the way home the school thought he was missing it was a whole thing and so the child ends up at home and they're like well how'd you get here and he's like the white man showed me and they're like what do you mean like how did you get here he's like the white man showed me and they like asked him this a couple of times and a couple of times and it wasn't until i don't know who put the pieces together but essentially he had followed he had waited to cross the street to the, you know when the walk sign like turns the little I don't, they don't, most of them don't do it now, but at the time it would turn into this little white little walking person. And that's how he would he use to guide himself home um, because he was so young that they couldn't fathom how he could have crossed the street by himself. So they thought maybe he got gotten abducted or something like that, but he had followed the, <laughs> the little guy in the box and he knew his way home from there and crossed the street safely. So I thought that, yeah. I think there's a whole mythology forming on this one. So I'll talk to you uh, privately about this musical, particular musical we can start, so. Rex, you got by without explaining the um, the Keys musical, by the way. I did notice that. I know. I just, I think I've explained it once before to most of this crowd. So. Okay. Um, so, uh, Akil, did you, did you want to read something? I will, but I'm still looking. Julia, did you follow? Okay. So, Julia? Yeah, I can spell for you. No worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, this was just a fun thing I wrote mostly on my phone that fateful summer when the red line kind of exploded and there were massive delays uh, and it took me like two hours just to get home. So this was largely inspired by those events. 
uh, and it's called We Apologize for the Inconvenience. I met my wife on the outbound Braintree line in the summer of 2019. She had just started her first year at Tufts University and was looking forward to dinner with her mother, who was visiting from out of town for the weekend. I had just finished my shift at Mass General Hospital, where a woman had screamed at me on the phone for half an hour because her doctor wouldn't prescribe her oxycodone for a chest cold. My grand plans for the evening were to watch the last half of the Sox game with a plate full of Totino's pizza rolls and a pint of Ben & Jerry's before crashing for the night. Our dreams were so simple back then. My now wife has been on the red line since Davis Square, and the train had been running smoothly up until Park Street, where I and half the population of Boston crushed ourselves into already packed cars, shoving the elderly and the infirm deeper into the angry mass of people itching to get home on a Friday night. I ended up wedged between a baby stroller and a man who refused to take off his backpack. The tiny toddler stared up at me, pinching my scrubs with sticky fingers. She is now my goddaughter, and this train is all she has ever known. Twice the doors attempted to close against the crush of humanity, and we pressed into each other the way a person sucks in their gut while trying to do up their pants after Thanksgiving dinner. When they opened again, a man with a rolling suitcase stepped back onto the platform, and as if accepting his sacrifice, the doors closed again for good. Our eyes met through the smudged glass. I still think about him sometimes, wonder where he ended up. We made it halfway into the tunnel before the train jerked to a halt, knocking people over like Bozo the Punching Clown, and a voice burst through the speakers in a screech of static. This train will be holding for several minutes due to traffic up ahead. We should be moving shortly and apologize for the inconvenience. This phrase now serves as our official national pledge of allegiance. Every now and then the train would crawl forward another few inches and then stop again. It seemed that eventually we must come out on the other side but the tunnel stretched on interminably. We got to know one another over the weeks, introduced ourselves in the darkness. For the longest time we debated the fairest way to determine the order in which we would eat our fellow passengers. The first one had been an easy decision. The man with a cardboard sign condemning us to hell and promising the return of Jesus Christ, whose voice had somehow not tired in all that time, had been sufficient for a day, divided among the rest of us. But after that, a decision could not be reached. Should we start with the elderly and work our way down in age? Men before women, fat people before thin ones? Eventually, with the helpful input of an English major from Emerson, we devised a lottery system. We agreed no children under 14 would participate as they were too young and did not have much meat on them anyway. Fortunately, there were two chefs on board who received a natural, natural immunity by condition of their profession. My wife had used one of her psychology textbooks as an improvised seat in the small indent near the, near the sail door that connected to the other cars. We took turns sitting on it and bonded over betting which passenger was due for a breakdown and which ones were secretly having affairs. This one required significantly less conjecture. We all shared a single train car. Despite our forced isolation, we tried to stay connected with the outside world. When the socks were finally eliminated from the season, we mourned, our cries of dismay and disappointment mixing with the teeny sounds blasting from a dozen phones and iPads. Foul play was suspected when the next person to pick the black spot was the car's sole Orioles fan, but the matter was not investigated too thoroughly. When the House of Representatives impeached the president, our little community broke into a civil war that ensured we did not need to use the lottery system for a week. We slept as comfortably as we could, using the clothes and bags of those who were no longer with us as bedding. One morning we woke just as the train was moving out of Broadway station, the doors already closed to us. It came to a stop halfway down the tunnel and stayed there. We set watches and shifts, but the train did not move again. My wife completed her undergraduate degree entirely online through the grace of her professors, who were all local and understood. We held a small graduation party, using my goddaughter's Hello Kitty toy keyboard to play an off-tune version of Pomp and Circumstance. The priest who married us was a nice old man. We lost him after the air conditioning broke down and the heat in the crowded car became so oppressive that several people collapsed. A foolish, hopeful youth jabbed at the emergency communication button, but they had stopped responding to us long ago. Sometimes we wondered if the conductor had simply jumped out the window, made a bid for freedom and left this life behind, leaving us forever trapped between Broadway and Andrew. Then a voice would come on the speakers, reminding us that we would be standing by for a few minutes, waiting for the train to clear the station ahead of us and we would feel that treacherous surge of hope, like the brief reprieve from a snake's poison as Sif once more held the bowl aloft over her lover's eyes. Our children grew up on the train, learned to read by the station maps and the graffiti painted onto the walls. The poles and straps served as their playground, the advertisements their entertainment as we took turns reading them aloud in different amusing voices. They liked to peer through the back window and wave at the kids from the neighboring train car, never knowing that life had once been different. I tell our children stories of the outside, the wind and the sounds and the openness. 
I struggle to describe what fresh air smells like, the taste of a French fry, this concept, concept of rain. I am old when the train finally emerges from the tunnel and into the sunlight, and those of us left who remember the old days all weep with angry joy. My wife is long gone, lost to an unlucky draw, and my children are grown. I have only just started to wonder how to go about teaching them how to live a life off this train, when our God speaks from the electric heavens. Attention passengers, we have a disabled train ahead at JFK, which is blocking our access to the Braintree platform. This train will return to Andrew Station in order to switch over to the Ashmont line. We apologize for the inconvenience. Huh. I love that. That was great. That was awesome. All right, I think I found something to read. All of this stuff is like rough and, you know, so bear with it. Um, oh, hold on. Sorry, phone ringing. It never rings, mind you. Like nobody ever calls me. The phone is like ringing right now. <laughs> Um, this is the beginning of one of the too many novels that I start and never finish. So here we go. Um, it's called Truth and Complication. So it has had many revisions and this is the most recent so far. It happened again. The dream where Nikki won't jump. I'm standing underneath her window begging her to jump, but she won't. She can't. It always happens this way. The dream. Always me screaming for her to jump, as if I had any chance at saving her, as if I were there to save her. I should have been there. I can hear her calling my name, yelling, Jalen, help me, yelling like she did when she was little, when she'd climbed something high like the jungle gym at the park or the top bunk in our room. She'd hold her hands out the way little sisters do when they need their big sisters to rescue them. I can hear her yelling, crying, begging. I can hear her even though I was nowhere to be found. In a dream, she cries for me until her throat is coated in soot, until she is choking and I'm choking too, until everything around us is engulfed in flames like we're swimming in the belly of some old angry volcano. I'd nev I've never been a strong swimmer, not the way Nikki was. She just took to water like a fish always the first to dive into the deep end, always ready to jump off the pier anytime we got invited to Dave Davi's house. They had their own personal pond. But in this dream, the one that happens every so often, the one that's haunted me since that day, Nikki is begging me to be the one to dive in this time. Then just like that, she's gone. I'm always disoriented after those dreams always unclear about the details as if, as if I've simply crossed into a different realm of the dream. I hate the kind of dreams that merge parts of your world that would never coexist under any other circumstance. Like starting off at your job, but the moment you walk into the break room, you're suddenly sitting at the table in your childhood kitchen. And your mother's complaining about dirty dishes and the chicken you forgot to take out of the freezer or the trash that's piled up or the room that's never clean, even if you were a kid who kept everything clean. Then you blink and you're walking down the aisle on your wedding day or standing over someone's grave or having a baby that is tiny but wears the face of your adult self. Nothing, nothing makes sense in dreams. Just like it doesn't make sense that I'm still haunted by Nikki's death. It's been almost 10 years now. I rub my eyes until they are no longer blurry and have adjusted enough to the artificial darkness created by the curtains Noelle insisted I buy. She thought they'd help me sleep. She thought they'd settle my mind because according to Noelle, sleeping next to me is like swirling around in a tornado at times. All the darkness seems to do is deep in my unease. It leaves me petrified at night, locks me in like those people who slip into that paralytic state for several moments before they fully awake. She's hard, she hardly sleeps over anymore. She blames it on Donovan Jr., DJ. Claims now that he's getting older, she needs to be home when he wakes that he asked too many questions about where she's been and I get it. Who wants to tell this six year old that they spent the night with the woman they're cheating on their father with? I focus on the chest of drawers in the corner of my room, the pillows underneath my bay window, the vision board I made at a vision board party Angie threw. It has all kinds of ideas like go to grad school, travel to London, write that screenplay, play, stop buying screenplays for dummy books, fix things with Ma. I was 18 when I left, 18 when Nikki died, but I had to leave. I couldn't stay in that house knowing Ma blamed me. She did blame me. 
I don't care what Angie in the world says. Mom blames me for Nikki dying in that fire. I blame me for Nikki dying in that fire. I sit up and pull my t-shirt over my head and toss it in the hamper across the room. I am drenched with sweat the way I often am after having that dream. Like my room, like my room is an inferno or something. I pick up the phone and sigh when I see that it's barely 2 a.m. I tap out a text to Noelle. I ask if she's up, although, she, although I know she's not. She works a 6 a.m. shift at the hospital, which means she's up at four and out by five because it takes an hour to get to, I'm still playing with the name, some random hospital, where she works on the weekends. She was a medic during, during her Navy days. That's where she met her husband, Donovan. He's still in a lifer who's only been home a total of 10 days and almost five years. And almost, in almost five years, I've known Noelle, back when we both worked at the group home. I dig around the bottom of my bed for one of the many shirts I leave there for these exact moments, put it on, then stand to my feet. My legs feel like lead, like they've been drugged or I'm trudging through wet cement, like I've been drugged or I'm trudging through wet cement. When I return from the bathroom, I have a single word reply from Noel, which reads, sleep. I call Angie instead. Angie and I have been friends since I showed up at her apartment, 18 and broke, needing a place to stay. I'd seen the ad on Craigslist. It was a simple ad that read, lesbian black female looking for queer friendly roommate to share two bedroom condo. There were only three pictures, one of the brick factory looking building, another of the open layout kitchen living room combo, and the final one, the available bedroom. I'd spent the past two weeks sleeping in the hallways of buildings against trees and parks, and a few nights I managed to get a bed at a teen shelter. I got into a fight after catching some girl going through my stuff. We both got kicked out the next morning. Angie took one look at me, dirty, stone-faced and desperate and said, you hungry? I'd never meant to become her charity case, but I was 18 and she was 25 and I'd soon learned that she was a social worker at some local charter school. So helping fucked up kids was kind of her thing. She was just what I needed. Someone who wouldn't pressure me to tell my story. Angie's only one rule was that I needed to work or go to school. And by school, she meant taking a few courses at the local community college. It had been a few days before my high school graduation when Nikki died. None of us went. I picked up my diploma a few weeks later and proceeded to withdraw all of the money in my bank account, all $2,000 from working at the summer camp in Foot Locker. And I hopped on a bus without a clear destination until I found myself in Atlanta a week later. I'd been planning to buy a car with that money. I was due to start my freshman year at Smith out in Northampton, but losing Nikki, I don't know, none of it seemed right anymore. I eventually explained all of this to Angie. Everything from my Jesus Christ is everything mom to my heathen of a father, always drunk, to leaving Nikki home by herself when mom's only instruction was to stay there until she got back. She never liked leaving Nikki with our pops. Never trusted him with either of us or anything really, but her vows meant something to her. And even more than that, being unmarried with kids just wasn't a thing. She told me not to leave, that if I did to take Nikki with me, but I needed to see Simone alone. There was no way I was lugging my 12 year old sister to meet up with my girlfriend, my first girlfriend. I guess the whole cliche about parents knowing best was a real thing because Nikki would still be alive if I had. Angie is wide awake, wide awake when, she, when Angie is wide awake when she answers. As a matter of fact, there's so much noise in her background that she has to put me on hold until she finds some place to quiet, some place quiet to go. The contrast in sound is instant. The chaos of too many conversations, the clanking of glasses, the tail end of dutty wine, trailing off as, if it, off as if Angie just closed the window on the world. Oh, so you know that's my song, she says, referencing Yolanda Adams as the battle is not over playing in the background. You sound busy, I say. Just call me tomorrow. No, Jay, I'm good. Just celebrating a friend's promotion. I told you about Tanisha, right? Angie says, I think for a moment. The shorty you're always drooling over despite the fact that she's clearly straight. Yeah, I know the one. Angie laughs. Don't come for me, Jalen. At least I'm not the one fucking a married woman. There's a hint of seriousness in her voice, though she buffers the back end with the laugh. Anyway, we went out for dinner, then someone had the bright idea to check out Club, Club Epsilon, that new reggae spot downtown. It's popping. I ain't gonna lie. My sister is too old to be out here partying all night. And you are not old. Child, please. Tell it to my knees and my back in the morning. Then her tone is serious again, filled with concern. What's up though, you good? 
I hesitate knowing the moment I say it, Angie will drop what she's doing coming straight here. It's what I want though, for someone who has the capacity to care to show up for me. Angie will always show up for me and I got her just the same. When I hear the urgency in her voice after calling my name for a second time, I finally say the dreams. And I'll stop there, but that's not, that's, that's just half the chapter. Thanks, Akila. No problem. Uh, Ella. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Clarissa. And it's good to see everyone. Um, so this cat is on my lap. Goodbye, cat. Um, so I get, I'm a writer, freelance writer for a Nuktuk magazine. It's um, published in Canada and it's the National Organization for Inuit, as I am Enoch. Um, and the cat's coming back. So yeah, so this is one my first story. I went up to um, Bowdoin College because they have the Piri McMillan Arctic Museum. So I don't know, I took pictures. I don't know if you can see them. There's this one and then there's this one. Is it close enough for you to see? Okay, so long story short, my maternal grandmother was the student of the woman who taught the Inuit the embroidery. So my grandmother's work is in here, but whatever. So it's, this magazine is translated into a Nuktut and syllabic Nuktut and French with English. So it's pretty exciting. Last March, I met with the, and it's published summer 2019. Last March, I met with curators at the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum in Brunswick, Maine, to find out how 92 pieces of Inuit sewn embroideries showing a Nukulut, little figures, ended up in the United States Museum. The curators wore blue latex gloves while they displayed dozens of embroidered cloths made by Nunatsiavami elementary students decades ago. I stared at the delicate designs in awe while I listened to the story behind them. In the 1920s, Kate Atash, a Moravian school teacher, started a sewing class in Maine. The art blossomed among Inuit students where they mastered embroidering, cultural scenes on napkins, placemats, and even tablecloths. It was Admiral McMillan who requested Labrador Kate teach in Maine. McMillan returned home to Maine by schooner with the students' artwork. During the 1940s and 50s, he bought and collected the embroideries and eventually gave them to the museum. They have sat in boxes for the past 60 years. The museum toured some of the historic embroideries around McCovick, Hope Dillon, Maine, last April. Quote, it was informative, a lot showed up, a lot of youth one. It was really cool to see, said Lavinia Jerusi, my cousin, who attended the exhibit in Maine called Nuno Javert Embroideries, 1940 to 1970s. Quote, some knew where the scenes were located. Some knew a great aunt who created one as a girl, unquote. So it's just exciting to, even though I'm in the South, to reach out to my fellow Inuit in the North. So thank you. I have two other articles published, but they're longer. So thank you. So good to see you. And I like how you refer to this is the South. <laughs> Thanks, Ella. Uh, so uh, Clarissa, do you want to close this out? Sure. Uh, I have I have one. I don't know if it's too heavy to end with, but you know, it's been a heavy year. So uh, it's called Prayer. And this was in uh, the Work magazine inside of Fredericks Fredericksburg. We beg to be acceptable as insects first. We promise to grow more human-like to your liking. We ask you to ponder the bugs who change their shapes from Heg Helgramite to Dobson fly, adjust from pincer to mandible. 
We've changed like they did from Philippe to Philip, McDouglas to Douglas, like tiny Puritans secreting husk-shaped mounds, like pilgrimite to pilgrim or colonite to colonist. Bless our vetted cornucopias. We pray their sound is sonorous enough to be acceptable to your liking. We'll offer fluttering hymnals sung in supplication like your beauty star butterflies. We have done it for years. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I, I feel like I have such an amazing writing family. Love all you guys. And thanks, Dad. Thanks, for everyone. <sighs> Thank you, Clarissa. That was amazing. And I, your book is brilliant. And I hope everybody buys one. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for sending so everybody up. else was common writer. You know, yeah, thanks everyone who read. Uh, it was a delightful evening and we appreciate your time and joining us. So please have a good evening and uh, we'll see each other on the next uh, CCW event. Thanks all. <laughs>